freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey everybody, Cheryl Todd here from Gun Freedom Radio, and I'm excited to be back on with my good friend that I haven't talked to in way too long, Marcus Allen Weldon. Now, Marcus wrote a book that he has just recently retitled to Surviving the System, the story of the Santa Shooter. So Marcus writes about an incident which occurred in Detroit, Michigan, in which he was protecting his own life and the life of a friend who was being physically assaulted by two men in a gas station. Now Marcus's story is a cautionary tale for all firearms owners. For taking this life-saving action, Marcus faced seven felonies and could have served a maximum sentence of 30 years and a minimum of 16. We are excited to be talking with him today as a free man with all charges defeated. Welcome to the show, Marcus. It's good to be back. It's good to see you again. Absolutely. I feel the same way. So, uh, we haven't seen you in a while. You've been kind of quiet and behind the scenes. And then all of a sudden, not only have you come back with, hold up your book, a new cover (laughs) and a new title to your book, but also you were on Tucker Carlson. Like, what have you been doing back there? You've been crouching, just waiting to spring back out? Like, talk to us about this. Yeah. You know, Shell. People had to take, they got to realize too, like right after my case was over, I was in a ton of debt. Okay. I, uh, I immediately jumped right out there and started traveling on my own expense, going to NRA shows. I was going to uh, Vegas for the SHOT show. And I never really regrouped and got my life together. Like I, I mean, I just spent a ton of money mm-hmm. and I released my book and I was trying to push it, but I just barely had the means to make it. And I was, you know, spending all everything on travel. So, and also my job, you know, made it real tough for me to move, travel as well. Um, so I eventually I had to just pull back. I had to say, okay, I had to, you know, I was in the process of buying my house. Of course, that suspense that I needed to take care of my daughter, new school. Um, I ended up rebranding my book and I just kind of just took time to decompose. I got a new job better paying job, a more supportive job. And then all of a sudden it was like, I told myself, I was like, I was gonna come out during Christmas time of 2019 after everything kind of settles down, I get myself together, then boom, out of the blue, Tucker Carlson uh, reached out to me with one of his reporters. And it just, I went, once we did the show, it took a while from the air. We did it like two weeks before they dropped it. Mm-hmm. And it has been, it went viral. I mean, right now, I think Cole Leonora just posted on his page. Uh, it was Chief Craig, Detroit Police Chief Craig. It was two segments. And um, it just really it followed up with a ton of local interviews and a great, great springboard for me to jump back in. Uh, and that is one thing that's a, always a conundrum. It's like, so what made Tucker Carlson's, you know, crew, whoever it is, executive producer, all of a sudden decide to do this report. And then because they're doing the report, how did they find you? Do you know any of that background story? I actually, yeah, it's, I got to give credit and shout out to Legal Arms in Detroit, Rick Ector. Yes. Um, they reached out to him as well as Chief Craig. And the first thing they asked Rick was, do you know anybody who will be interested with some kind of self-defense story? And Rick Ector, being my good friend and also who was my legal uh, uh, self-defense expert in my case, mm. jumped right in and said, I know the guy. And he pointed him in my direction. They came right away. They looked my story up. They said, why have we not heard of this guy? And exactly. they, 
interviewed me and they said it was at first it was going to be one segment but it, they were like we have to split this up because we have so much good footage and they wanted to give me um a time for myself and uh as well the, as well as the other young lady who had a, a situation too i think her name was elena she had a, a situation so they wanted to split both segments up but rick ector was the one who brought my name up and they were like why haven't we heard of this guy this is this is i mean you know they were just blown away it you know, I'm just so glad that the, the stars aligned the way that they did and the timing of it is just, you know, perfect for, you know, the relaunch of the book and, and all of that. But, you know, this is such an important story. Yours is such an important story because I think there's a lot of firearms owners out there that think that <sighs> I am only ever going to be the good guy in the story. And since I'm only ever going to be the good guy, I'm never going to misuse my firearm, then I've seen all the movies, right? The good guy, he, you know, hands things over to the, the authorities when they show up to clean up the mess and they walk on into the sunset. Right. And yours is the perfect example to show that that does not happen. That is not how it goes down. And sometimes the good guy is treated, I think in your case, worse than the, the actual aggressor in the, the situation. Yeah, so true. Um, there's a lot of evidence in my case that was held back until the last minute. And uh, one thing I liked about the Tucker Carlson piece is that and by you reading the book, you have more context to the story than most, but they started the video off. I mean, they started the segment off with part of the video showing the man running to the car and digging under the seat. And that's a piece that the public never seen. You know, the public thought that I shot this guy who was just trying to get to his car and go home after a, a physical altercation. And, I, and, I, and as you can see, uh, you know, the video was grainy, of course. It wasn't the best video, but it sh the gestures were there that showed his intent. So, um, but that was held back as well as the 911 footage. And they didn't, uh, they didn't play the whole 911 video, not footage, but video. Of, I mean, the, uh, the actual recording of 911 on Tucker Carlson. They didn't play the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But that also, talked about it being two shooters and that never was omitted because of the disappearing um clerk hmm. and that's yeah. the thing is the fact that well it's a grainy video but it exists and exists. how long you went through it and all of the wasn't there added expense even trying to obtain this video yes uh, extra 1200 bucks actually I, a little bit more but i think it was 1700 because we had to what we did was we grabbed the video and we had an expert modify it and try to zoom in. And the prosecutor said, no, you can't modify the video because they, they made it seem like we were trying to make the video look like it was something that it wasn't. All we did was just took it and put a magnifying glass on it. That's all we did. Right. And um, so they, they wouldn't, after I spent the money for the video to get a magnifying glass put over it, they said I couldn't use it. And they used the grainiest video ever which is the whole reason why, like, we were just trying to make it clear. But the, the jury still, you know, one of the jury members told me, he said, um, you know, it was so hard to see. I asked her, can she zoom in? <laughs> and I kind of laughed, you know, this was after the case was over because I was like, well, we had the one with the magnifying glass on it for you to see zoomed in, but she wouldn't let us use it. Well, they're going to use every trick in the book they possibly can. And, and they clearly did with you. And so you, actually were held in a jail cell right right, right. and um the wayne county jail first the mound correctional facility but then they transferred me to wayne county and you were strictly doing what the good guys do what we're taught to do when we're taking these defensive uh self-defense classes and so on and so forth and then it just really does come down to Praise God, there was video and audio evidence to back up your version because it looked like everything was stacked against you. It was almost like a foregone conclusion that, and I don't know what the thought process was because I can't climb in the minds of the, the prosecutor and the, the police and that sort of thing. But it's like, okay, so we're done here. We have a guy. He had a gun. Doesn't matter if you had it legally or not, which you did, right? Right. And uh, 
I don't know, maybe because they, they thought, well, it fits some stereotype in their mind that the color of your skin even played a part. And they're like, okay, we know exactly what happened here, which was exactly not what happened there. And thought that they had written the rest of your life out for you. Yeah, and I think the whole thing was once because of the media attention, the prosecutor didn't want to drop it because she felt like I'm not going to drop it. This is a, you know a high profile case. Is they they tried to attack him like a pit bull, makes him look good on TV to get a conviction. But um, one of the things I think they were banking on was me taking a plea deal mm -hmm. because there's no way with the evidence, with the lies that were said on stand and the stand in the, in the preliminary with the witness that was talking, speaking on my behalf, which was uh, the young lady, there's no way they could have beat this case. I just didn't see it. Like, I was like, how are you going to defend all of this evidence and back it up with lies? I mean, eventually there's going to be a moment where the people who were the jury and the judge were going to see like, okay, this is not right. But they still went through with it. I just kept telling them, no, I'm not taking the plea. Mm hmm so whatever they thought, uh, it included the fact that you happened to be wearing a Santa suit. And right. so then I'm sure the, the media, the news crews loved that because now here's this whole, you know, odd angle uh, of the story. And that's how you became known as the Santa shooter. You weren't shooting Santa. You were dressed as Santa and you were involved in a, a DGU, a defensive gun use. Um, I like that like that DGU <laughs> yeah. and um and I think the whole thing just took on a life of its own right. and it seemed like they wanted to because I, I think it was in the the book that I I realized this or it could have been on one of our previous interviews that even when they wanted to show pictures of you on the news it was either you on the ground in your Santa suit with them handcuffing you or it was some old photo that mm -hmm. made you look just a little bit like a, a hood rat or something. Right. 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 Exactly. It was all, it's all about painting the image to fit the narrative, you know? And, um, I was, I think it was, it was even crazy when I was talking to the officer in the car because, uh, he was kind of shocked how well-spoken I was. He didn't expect me to, um, you know, speak the way I did, you know, he was expecting me to be more of a, you know, I guess you could, they're, they're stereotype of a thug, you know, and, you know, when he was, when I talked to him and I was, you know, I was calm yet, I was, you know, shaken up, but I was still able to kind of like, let him know like, Hey, this, this is not what it seems. It made him dig deeper. And if you also recall in the book, I also ran back into that officer mm -hmm. and he told me that the video existed. Yes. Yes. Praise God for that. But so at the time, you know, the two, the two images that they wanted to drill into the public's mind, you know, you, when you were, I don't know, you were very young, you had this kind of a, a hood rat look, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and then you in that Santa suit. And the reality was this completely different person that they weren't portraying. You were very involved with your community doing a right. ton of work for your community, very involved in your church, uh, even involved in, in politics in a certain degree, right? right. And exactly. they, it, it's like they just wanted to ignore the real you and they just were excited about portraying this other version of you. So what, what were the things that you were involved in at the time? Well, I was working with the uh, recreational department with the mayor and I was just, um, Actually, I was just starting. I never got a chance to actually fully get my foot in the door because the case happened right away. But I was mentoring young men with the, uh, they had a mentor program with the mayor that I was involved in. Um, I was involved heavy with skilled trades. I was, uh, I'm licensed um, to do HVAC myself. And I was really trying to get a lot of young people to fill that skilled trades gap and take advantage of these job opportunities and even start their own business. And um, so we were teaching people at my church how to fix furnaces, air conditioner units, um, also auto mechanic repair, um, different things to give them skill sets so they can go out and be productive in the world and society and get these jobs. Um, I, I, you know, I also was, you know, of course, a father as well. So that's, a, that's also a, a, a role to be filled as well. And just trying to just show the true image of a, a father and how you, sh how you should be. Mm -hmm. um especially as a single father so 
you know, all these things that I were doing. It, and it was just, it was me. It wasn't like I'm doing it just because I need some accolades or something. You know, I was doing it just because this is how, this is my passion. So exactly. uh, I always was passionate about this, but this case, it derailed me with everything. A lot of the um, things I was involved in, other than my church, other than my church, mm-hmm. a lot of the people pulled back away because I was viewed as like, you know, I guess a pariah to their whole organization or something. I don't know. I was looking, I was looked as the, as the bad Santa, bad publicity. Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. Well, you have recovered in spades because uh, you were just mentioning you, you've bought a house now, right? Right. And uh, you are still a great dad to your now 10-year-old. Like, how did that happen? The back of the book says six. That <laughs> lets you know how long her case, the case was. But, yeah, she's 10 now. And she actually has kind of moved on and forgot a lot about the situation. She's kind mm-hmm. of like, you know, it, you know, it was kind of it was affecting her a while back when she was five going on six. But now she's at the age, she's kind of like, ah, I really don't really remember too much. Mm-hmm. So, um She's, she's moved on. So that's good. I was really afraid that it was going to affect her yeah. a lot more. Well, you've uh, given her that stability. And, and when you say that, uh, you know, a lot of the things you're involved in pulled away from you or caused you to have to move away from them, except your church. I think that's huge too. Uh, pl- allowing that kind of stability in, in kids' lives um, is so important. And I saw even on Tucker Carlson that they were giving credit to your church for helping yeah. with the financial burden of all of this. I thought that was very good of them to uh, include that. Uh, the producer texted me like the day before it aired or two days before it aired. He said, is it okay if we you know, mention your church? I said, yeah, go right ahead. So he, they wanted to include that. And uh, that was a huge piece. Mm-hmm. And my pastor, he loved it. You know, he, he felt like that was a great... Uh, we, we just got a new church. So he was like, oh, that's great. You know, he was, we, we shot the actual footage in the church too, by the way. You know, Beautiful. Know. With the stained glass windows. Oh. Yes. Yeah. I thought it was very well put together. And, um, but my church definitely deserves a lot of credit because most churches, mm-hmm. they shy away from guns. Yeah. And my pastor was asked on the news, why are you doing this? And he said, I know this man. Mm-hmm. And if he had to pull the trigger, it was a reason behind it. And I'm standing behind him mm-hmm. and I'm going to put my name and church on the line if, if need be. So it took a lot because if, if it didn't turn out well, if I was lying or if I was really, you know, not giving all of the truth mm-hmm. to the, what happened, it could have made him look bad, you know? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people was worried about looking bad and standing behind me, even though they knew me for a number of years. Yeah. Yeah. So it allowed me to see how people react when adversity hits and I get to see people in their true colors now. So now I'm a different person. I don't, you know, I'm not so quick to think someone's supportive of me and is my friend when things are going well, because I know how stuff can get. So um, I'm very, uh, I'm I'm, I'm really, I'm a a lot more calculated when I, you know, open up to people. Let's just say that. (laughs) No, I understand that. It's just, uh, you know, uh, trust, but verify. <laughs> so, right. right. <laughs> so, um, and so another thing you were talking about how the, the trades, the skill mm-hmm. trades are so important to, uh, yourself and to young people and how you are already back then mentoring young men into that field. And you were just telling me that you are still in that mindset and moving in that direction in a big way just bought a, a building did you say yeah got a building a uh, 16,000 square feet in the auction we got it actually in uh, Detroit um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the actual uh, people just the young people around the community we got a couple of trainers and uh, instructors we're going to actually have them refurbish and, re- and re- uh, revitalize this building you know electrical, plumbing, they're going to do all the hands-on work, get the experience, work with the instructors, work with the journeymen. And um, afterwards, they'll have a skill set that can help them transition into maybe an apprenticeship. And um, also, um, now that we can kind of control our own narrative with this building, I want to also do self-defense classes. I want them to learn how to uh, uh, not just not just um, get their CPL, but I want them to actually understand firearm safety Yes. how to uh you know because a lot of these guys are going to be a little bit underage you know so I, they, they're not going to necessarily be able to get their their license but 
if they'll know how to handle firearms if if they're in an area where they happen to see a gun um how to hold it you know they won't get brainwashed by this these movies out here where people are shooting guns sideways and you know looking crazy right. but um they're going to learn a lot rick ector's also volunteered to help teach the young people and people who want to be you know more knowledgeable of firearm safety who want to get their CPL. So we'll be able to do all that here. We'll be able to control that narrative and uh, get all the skill sets they need. That's awesome. I'm so excited about that. Do you have like a name for it yet or is it still in so development? It's still, you know, right now it's the Eastern District Development Center because we're on the East District of Detroit. Um, I'm trying to think, am I going to allow that name to stick? Uh, so far, that's where we're at. We're, we're, we're running with it, but it is, it is the east side of Detroit. Um, but uh, the actual program itself, I'm still working on. I'm going to have that um, put out here. I'm actually getting a GoFundMe link because uh, uh, we're going to have to raise money to get it, you know, get all this stuff to, together. But one of the good things about it, I was at a meeting today, and um, someone who was a vice president of a huge company called Train, which is one of the biggest companies in the HVAC world, decided to donate some of their uh, uh, units, rooftop units for heat to the building. And one of the reasons why they did so was because guess what? They seen my story on Tucker Carlson. <laughs> I love it. That's so, amazing. Well, and also the local trained. news stations. Right. So um, let's just say that a lot of the stuff is coming out of that Tucker Carlson show that's going to really, really benefit just everything because a lot of people now, I mean, I'm getting tons and tons and tons of e M e uh, e uh, inboxes on Facebook and stuff. So a lot of people are just like, you know, they're, they, they understand the skilled trades gap as well. That's a huge crisis we're going through right now. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people can't, um, you know, don't have the skill sets to take these jobs. So yeah. it was great. I just, I just found that out today. He told me he was going to send a unit, one of his units that he had. It was a used unit. He's going to give it to us. That's amazing. And thank you, Tucker Carlson and Fox News and, and your local Fox 4. I right. know you've done a ton of very positive uh, stories on you to help people better understand the, the true story of what happened and not just the sensationalism. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm also Friday, I'm going to the, I got invited to Jackson's prison. They have a vocational program there that they're uh, helping returning citizens. And they want my input as well. So they want me to come and check, take a look and see what they got going on. So um, they, they think my story would be impactful as well because sure. could I could have been in Jackson's prison. That's up, up north of Michigan. So I'm going out there Friday. Sure. Well, just even the fact that because um, when we first met, you were still, let's say you had been cleared. The case was settled but there was still some lingering stuff. They still had your firearm. They hadn't released it back to you, that sort of thing. And so a lot of this was still very, very fresh. Like you, you experienced trauma through this, like on multiple levels. Right, right. And uh -oh. your camera just turned off. Yeah, somebody's calling. Hey, I'll, I'll, hold on. Sorry, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, um, yeah. And so uh, some of the trauma I think was because you were facing seven felonies up to 30 years and you were hearing probably every day, multiple times a day, just take the plea, just take a year, right? And then you'll be right. back to your life. But I am so thankful that you were smart enough to realize, no, I'm not back to my life. I'm going to wear that great big letter F felon for the rest of my life. It's going to impact everything I do, how I can, uh, uh, provide for my child, you know, on and on. And how many people are sitting in that prison that you're going to go interact with that maybe are in the exact same boat, right? They just took the plea, right. just make it go away because you can't afford it because you can't keep sitting in this holding cell. You kept talking about, I think it was the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, chapter three. Welcome to the county. And I did that. Those peanut butter and jelly sandwich sandwiches were the best they had. So that's the messed up part about it. But, but um, yeah, I think um, you 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 hit some you hit something on the nose when you said trauma. Another thing, and I can see it in my 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 like my early interviews. Like I could see 
I remember I, it was at the GRPC. I spoke. I think this was the first time at the. I think this was in Orlando. I mean, no, no, this was Dallas. I think it was Dallas. And I was like, really, like you can see it in my eyes. Like I was like, this PTSD was like pouring out of me. And I was like, the way I was talking, you know, my thought process, like everything. And I was like, kind of like, you know, just all over the place, you know. And um, someone approached me, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was a doctor as well. And he told me, he said, uh, I could see that you're, you're, you're like dealing with some post-traumatic stress. I don't think you realize it, but he was like, I can tell the way you're talking, like, you know, that yeah. it's, it's showing. And I went back and I looked at some of my interviews and I could see it now because I've kind of like come back and kind of, you know, getting back on an even playing field. But I can see it. Like, I was like, whoa, like I was just, my thoughts are racing. It was just like, that, that, and that's why I go back to earlier in the interview when we were talking, like, I, I just was fresh off this thing. So I'm like running all over the place. I was also going to people's trials, trying to help them out, giving them the best information that I could give them. I'm running to NRA conventions. I'm running to GRPCs. Like, and I'm still like not taking care of Marcus. Right. You know, and then, and next thing I know, I'm on the verge of a possible mental meltdown. Sure. You know, and uh, I had to just say, I got to get myself together. I got to like get some of this debt. I'm like, I got like $6,000 of debt left, which is great. Yeah. And, um, uh, people keep calling me. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> okay. So, uh, but yeah, so no, I, I just say that, you know, so that's back to, you know, why I kind of just disappeared. I mean, mm -hmm. my mental health, you know? Yeah, no, that's smart. That's very wise that you were tuned in enough to realize, all right, I've got to, I've got to go recharge, right? I've got to regroup and then I can come back out strong. And you have, I mean, awesome opportunities came your way, but you, you met them. And you are, uh, the, like I, you said, the Tucker Carlson thing. And one of the things I want to talk about, I only saw, I think, uh, the second uh, Tucker Carlson, the, the part two. Mm -hmm. I've got to go back and find the part one. But in part two, Chief Craig, I think I'm saying his name right, your police mm -hmm. chief there, I was so encouraged to hear what he was saying a lot of times we only hear our sheriffs because sheriffs are elected by the people. They represent the people that elected them. Uh, they tend to be more connected with their oath to uphold and preserve the Constitution. Uh, but your Chief Craig was, he, one of the things he said was, we are glad that we have responsibly armed citizens in our uh, community because the bad guys are more afraid of the armed citizens than they are of the uh, uniformed officers. And some of that is because there's a, there's a bit of a shortage, I, I think I understood from that report in your city. And, um, you know, that's what we are supposed to do, right? Armed citizens are supposed to help keep our, ourselves safe, our homes safe, our neighborhoods safe, our communities safe, our, you know, it just expands out from there. And so it, I, I was happy to hear on network news, somebody has such a, a level head about that. And, and it happened to be someone who was wearing a uniform and, and wasn't a, an elected uh, uniform wearer, so. Yeah, he did a great job. And he's, he's been an advocate for quite some time. I even got a quote in my book. Um, I think it was chapter three where I quoted him. And actually I have the book right here. I'll, I'll pull it up read you the quote because um he, he 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 had this quote and he it was in the nra magazine i believe of like 2000 and was it 2017 he says uh we're not advocating violence we're advocates of not being victims mm. right so that was uh a quote he made that was in the nr on the nra uh, magazine of 2000 i think it was 16 mm. um but i thought that was exactly it said everything in a nutshell i mean we're not advocate advocating violence we're advocates of not being victims i mean period period exactly well thank you so much for taking the time with us and and rehashing that story you know i hate that uh you know when 
when my guest is someone like yourself, where it's so important for us to know your story that we have to keep going back and touching on the worst moments of your life. Um, but I appreciate so much that you will let us do that because we have to know what reality is and we can't get caught up in what we think, you know, the movies show us is, is the truth about, you know, good guys with guns and how it goes with the legal system. Um, are you representing any of those, uh, those self-defense insurance companies or, or any of those things, it seems like they would be knocking your door down to say, he is an example of why you need us because right. it's expensive. I mean, you had $50,000 worth of, of legal fees to deal with. Um, and, and it was a perfectly justifiable uh, DGU. Yeah. So firearms legal protection, they, um, they sponsored me for a couple of speaking engagements I did, and they also gave me a free membership. They're the only one. They're a little small. They're smaller than the other ones. Like they're still building, but they're, I know they're, they're stationed in Dallas. And actually, my attorney, one of my attorneys I use in my case was actually uh, one of their attorneys that represents them. And um, so I'm actually covered. They gave me a lifetime membership. Um, so firearms, legal protection. Um, I, was in dis I was discussing some things with Tim. I was at Tim Summit. Summit from USCCA, I believe his last name is. Mm -hmm. um, that was in Kentucky, but nothing ever came out of it. I haven't heard back from him, but um, I think USCCA is another great program. Mm -hmm. They were one of the first ones that really came on the scene for something like, like uh, 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 legal protection. But, um, and of course, you know, I spoke at the NRA convention um, and that was during the time that NRA carry guard was really being pushed heavy. I'm not sure where they are, but I did speak at the convention for them um when uh we were back in uh was that where, where, where were we at we were that was, uh atlanta yeah right? yeah, yeah atlanta. i was gonna say louisville but nope you're right it was it was georgia so yeah um, so, um but uh yeah i i, I don't know maybe at, since this tucker carlson piece has really dropped who knows i mean it may be an opportunity to to you know follow back up with a, a guy like tim and uh see what we can do Absolutely. Well, it just is so important for everyone to understand that, um, you know, there by the grace of God go any of us, because you weren't looking for a fight. You were just trying to stop one that found you. Um, and I, I'm so glad and your friend is probably thanking her lucky stars forever that you were there that that night and that you took action. Um, yeah. So how do we follow your work now that you're uh, back live and in charge? How do we reach out and get a copy of your newly rebranded book? So my website's still the same, Mark, www.marcusweldon.com. That's still the same. Um, Marcus Allen Weldon, of course, is all of my social media. If you use that, it's Facebook, Instagram. And uh, if you put it on Twitter, I think Marcus the Gun Guy is Twitter. Yeah, Marcus the Gun Guy. I'm going I'm to actually change that to Marcus Allen Weldon if I can. But uh, also Amazon. Amazon is probably the best way to get the book, mm -hmm. Surviving the System. Like, I'll show you the cover again so people know. Yeah. Um, the Santa Shooter uh, is still out there as well, but it's the same book. But the uh, Surviving the System is, on, uh, is now the, you know, the face of the Kindle and Amazon account. Um, so Kindle e-books e are available as well. So if you want to download it, a lot of people love the e-book. I'm not a big fan of e-books. I love paper, but, you know, this new generation loves it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, Amazon and my website and uh, Barnes & Noble website as well has the uh, book as well. So if you go on barnesandnoble.com, type in uh, the Santa Shooter, it should pop right up. Fantastic. Well, I'm so glad that you're past all of that oh there was one other thing i wanted to touch on uh yeah so when we first met your case was done but they had not returned your firearm to you oh right 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 Let's right go that story real quick because that's even a weird piece that none of us think about when we are walking right. around with our open or concealed carry firearms or even you know own them in our homes and sometimes bad guys come into our homes and we have to uh, engage them in these ways. So what was the story with that? 
So they never gave my firearm back. They kept running me in circles. And I ended up just buying a new one because I was so tired of waiting. But recently, actually yesterday, I was some, um, there was an attorney that rushed out to me that was familiar with my case as well as a gun advocate here in Michigan. And there, uh, there's a class action lawsuit that's going on for uh, uh, quite a few people with, the, uh, I think, Wayne County. Um, with their uh, not them not returning their firearms after legally defending themselves and after the case was dismissed. So uh, I'm in a process of being involved in that myself because uh, we're going to go after them because that is my property. And it was an XDM Springfield 40 caliber and it was not cheap. You know, it was I think close to $600. Nice. So, um, you know, I want my $600 back or, or my gun, one or the other. And what so, what reason are they using for this? Is it another you know the last thing they told me, Yeah, they, they lost like I think I think I remember they had lost it or they couldn't they couldn't find it. They were looking for it. They told me to get back with them. And after they said they lost it, I kind of realized where they were going with. I said they're going to just keep running this thing. So the the way they get you and keep in mind, I just got out of the case. So I'm going back and forth down there like, "Hey, where's my gun?" And after a while, you keep hearing this, we're trying to locate it or come back the next day or the person who's in charge is not here. After a while, you just kind of like, you know, get like, throw your hands up. Like, I'm ready to get on with life, you know? Yeah. And um, so I wasn't mentally prepared to like put the pressure on them after yeah. they kept denying me the first couple of times. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted my attorney to take that bull by the horns, but uh, he's like, hey, my job here is done. You're free. <laughs> Which, I mean, I can understand, you know. Yeah. And uh, so now I'm like, hey, well, they, they owe me a check then if they lost my gun. So we're getting ready to, uh, to really push, press that issue with the, uh, with the attorneys involved now. Well, and especially the, the whole rigmarole that you've been through with that entire, I don't know, department. Like, I'm not sure exactly how to the justice system in that area but there was also this middle piece that you realized after you had actually done some of that traveling that you were talking about, where you were running around, going to the NRA annual meetings and all that kind of stuff. You came to find out, thankfully, in a good way and not in a bad way, that there was some clerical error that had your name flagged that you still weren't allowed, allowed as a free man to leave your state and you could have ended up in more legal jeopardy even though you were completely cleared yep and i and i was actually if i got pulled over in atlanta when i was with you mm -hmm. they would have arrested me because i was not supposed to leave the state with that legal i think it was called a, a lien on my name mm -hmm. Um, and the reason why this was on there was because the Wayne County jail, after we went up there and told him, Hey, here's the paperwork. And the second time we went up there, I went up there personally, first time my attorney, the second time me, and the third time I sent another attorney down there that I paid another thousand dollars to clear everything up. And I had to go, uh, that was another thousand dollars out of my pocket. If you remember that time I was uh, raising money for that. You do. Um, they eventually took it off, but uh, yeah, they they and we actually had to go to the news. I had to go to the news. Yeah, I had to go to a local news station and put them on blast. And they had the nerve to say I never followed through and and went to the ninth floor of rec the, the Department of Records and turned my paperwork in. Was which was like I, I was I can't believe there's a lie like that on that on a on local TV because clearly I was up there with my attorney and the second time myself, and um, they just flat out lied. They, they, they just said, oh, well, you know, that was my attorney's job to go to the Department of Records, and I didn't do it. And I'm just shaking my head like, wow. <laughs> it's and, crazy. You know, and I'm, crazy. I, I am so thankful that you didn't find out because you got pulled over for, a, you know, not using your blinker or taillight, you know what I mean, and then landed back in jail. Um, but, in Georgia. Georgia, <laughs> I know. Like. Oh my God. Can you imagine that? Can no. you imagine going to the NRA convention and you're like, Marcus just got arrested. <laughs> I'm sorry. He can't make it to the interview because he's in the slammer, right? I mean, I mean oh. that, that, that would have threw everything off. <laughs>
<laughs> well, God has got you. He, he has carried you through this. Um, and I, I know you do give him credit. And um, it's, it's been such a crazy journey. I'm glad that you've written it down. Uh, I think that you've probably helped thousands of people already just with that cautionary tale or people who maybe, maybe they're thinking about giving the plea and then they read that mm -hmm. you just made the course and it'll encourage them to do the same or, you know, could encourage somebody else to get that self-defense insurance or get more training or who knows. But uh, I think all good things are going to come out of this, even though, man, I, I wouldn't wish what you went through on anyone. Yeah, me either. <laughs> right. So, all right, we'll hold that book up one more time. We're going to wrap up here and get out. There it is. Marcus Weldon, Surviving the System. That is such, uh, such an awful and true thing to have to say. Okay. I had an epiphany, and I just came up with that. I was, like, literally laying in the bed, and it, I don't know. It just came to me. And then all of a sudden, this, this cover of me on the chalkboard just came to me. And I'm like, this is it. I figured it out. That is it. It's perfect. Well, thank you again so much. We will definitely be checking back in with you and uh, following your, your journey. And I'm so excited about your right now being called the Eastern District, District Development, Development Center. Center to uh, help the next generation to uh, learn skills and um, be safe themselves and be able to grow into uh, heads of households. Um, we need more people doing that kind of work. And I'll send you all the information. Uh, I'm going to be working on it all week. So I, when I get everything up and going, I'll make sure I send it to you. Fantastic. Always a huge pleasure to spend any time I can with you, my friend. Yeah, we'll, we'll see each other soon. I hope maybe, uh, I don't know whether it be GRPC or conv next convention that comes up something we'll find a, a time we'll find a way all right thank you so much marcus allen weldon all right all right gang stick around there's always lots more coming up on gun freedom radio